Welcome to the last Plurilingual Lab Speaker Series this winter. I'm Aisha Barise, your host and a PhD student at McGill in Educational Studies and Language Acquisition. I would like to begin with my sincerest appreciation and gratitude to the Center of Learning and Performance for kindly sponsoring this event and the Belonging, Identity and Language Diversity Research Group and the Faculty of Education at McGill for supporting this event. To start off with, I'd like to begin with e to acknowledge uh, the diverse indigenous peoples whose presence mark the, um, the, ter the territory of Turtle Island, also known as Canada, where peoples of the world gather today. I uh, live in Chautauqua, also known as Montreal, which is historically a gathering space, space for many First Nations. I acknowledge the indigenous peoples of this land, including the Haudenosaunee and, and Anishinaabe nations. I would also like to invite you um, to reflect on the meaning of land acknowledgement in relation to reconciliation action and their limitation in acknowledging um, deep injustices in indigenous communities um, that, that, that could continue to endure to over centuries. So to start off with, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the three panelists today. Uh, first, we have the editor, Dr. Um, Ruth Fielding is a senior lecturer at Monash University and researches um, multilingualism, language education, and identity. Dr. Fielding is um, a researcher and a professional um, at uh, the many centers around the world and that it, and specifically exploring bilingualism, multilingual identity, um, language teacher education, pedagogy, assessment, in language learning and teaching, intercultural approaches in language education. Her research has appeared in um, the International Journal of Bilingual Education, Bilingualism, Foreign Language Annals, Language Learning, Language Education, uh, Babel, and a number of edited volumes. And our second chapter contributor today is Dr. Gary Bonar. Uh, Dr. Bonar is a lecturer in the Master of TESOL and Languages and Humanities Specialist courses at the Faculty of Education at Menosh University in Australia. Um, prior to this position, Dr. Menosh worked in Victorian secondary education sector and most recently um, in the role of curriculum coordinator um, at uh, responsible for literacies and language and social sciences. And he has taught two courses, two language courses, Japanese and Italian and English as an additional language in secondary schools. In addition to that, he also has 10, over 10 years of experience teaching English in diverse sectors in Asia and Europe. And our second chapter contributor is Dr. Uh, Anushka Van Hooft, is a professor at um, social anthropology at Anonymous University of San Luis Potosi in Mexico. Her research is grounded in sociocultural and critical perspectives of language and society, and her main uh, scholarly interests are related to the situation of the indigenous languages in Mexico. Uh, Dr. Anushka is committed to collaborative and participatory projects with the, with the speakers to address the community's language reclamation goals and, and agenda. This work includes research on oral tradition, community-based language documentation, and revitalization and digital language activism, and the promotion of indigenous literacies. So uh, before we get started, I'd like to give us a quick reminder of the Zoom etiquette. Please remember to keep your video and sound off during the talk. Reactions are welcome, such as clapping and thumbs up features. Uh, note that the talk is being recorded and will be available at the Plurilingual Lab YouTube channel. After the talk, we are going to have a 30 minute discussion moderated by my colleague, uh, Hannah Kim. At this time, you are welcome to post your questions in the chat and unmute yourself um, and only during the discussion period. And uh, that covers it. I now hand it over to Dr. Fielding to start sharing your screen. Thanks so much, Anisha. Um, I'm just gonna check that my screen shares properly. <clears throat> Okay, thanks so much for having me here today to present to you. Um, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the lands on which I speak to you um, today and recognise that sovereignty was never ceded. I would like to specifically acknowledge 
um, that the Wurundjeri and Bunwarun people, communities of the Kulin Nation, are the ongoing custodians of the lands on which Monash University now stands. We pay our respects through our research, our teaching and learning to the Wurundjeri and Bunwarun elders and their past, present and future communities. Um, so we've already seen this screen, so I might uh, skip over this one, but just to give you an overview of our talk today, um, I'm going to start off um, talking to you about the background to how this book came about um, and talk a little bit about some of the theoretical ideas and my own research that kind of led towards the culmination of, of the project of this book. Um, and then I'll hand over to Dr. Gary Bonner, who's going to talk about his chapter within the book. And finally, to uh, Datora Anushka Vantehuft, who's going to speak about her um, chapter. And then hopefully we'll all three, um, well, all three of us, possibly not Gary, he has to go and teach <laughs> straight after this, um, and then respond to your questions. So um, the book really brings together the three, three quite big themes um, in education, interculturality, identity, um, and multilingualism. And how I came about to wanting to kind of pull together those three themes in this book has been quite a long journey. Um, on the screen there, you'll see on the left, three inter interlocking circles, which come from the language teaching curriculum document that I taught with as a French and German teacher back in the early 2000s in the state of New South Wales in Australia. Um, and at that time, there were kind of early signs of an intercultural stance within the curriculum. So we had three strands within the curriculum using language, the, the communicative skills, making linguistic connections between different languages, and the third strand there, moving between cultures. Um, and as I undertook my PhD and then became a, a language teacher educator and working with pre-service teachers, we really had a big focus on how to to focus on this intercultural strand within the curriculum, the moving between cultures, which whilst it still had um, some static elements of, you know, moving between distinct and separate cultures, nonetheless sort of appeared to be relatively groundbreaking at the time, you know, 20 years ago, um, having this particular feature so central within the curriculum was quite um, was quite interesting and important to us as teacher educators to emphasize. Um, alongside that, my PhD research didn't really look at interculturality. <laughs> it, I looked um, at identity and multilingualism for young children in a primary school who had multiple languages in their home environment, but then also multiple languages at school um, enrolled in a quite unusual bilingual program in the Australian context. Um, and I talked to those children about their identities, how their languages formed part of that. Um, and over the, over the years, those sort of two strands of research for me increasingly appeared to kind of cross over with each other. Um, the ideas of, um, you know, dispelling the, the, the sort of binary notions within both um, pieces of work um, became increasingly important. A number of other intersections kind of kept kind of cropping up. And I thought oh, it, it would be really interesting to actually um, unpack a bit more about how these ideas relate to each other. Um, a piece of work that I did with two other teacher education colleagues um, really built the, the groundwork for my thinking about intercultural understanding as we were talking, uh, as we were terming it at the time. Um, and we worked with our pre-service teachers to, to kind of work out what, what would you actually do in the classroom to try and help your students be more intercultural in, um, in, their, in, in their interactions. And to do that, we videoed language teachers who were working with this New South Wales curriculum and trying to be more intercultural in their classrooms. We videoed them and then we transcribed the interactions from the classroom and we showed those transcriptions to our free service teachers and got them to discuss how the interaction was intercultural or wasn't so intercultural, where were the, the openings for that sort of reflection um, and where were things kind of perhaps being stunted in their, in their development of ideas um, where they could have been more opportunity to be more intercultural. So I'm going to read you an extract um, from one of the discussions. Just got to move everybody's faces out of the way so I can see this. <laughs> um, so the first student, student one, 
reads out from the translation of the of the teacher. It's a, a, an Italian lesson in, in Sydney. Um, and she read out, what do young Italians and Australians like to do on festivals, on festival days? Um, and the next student says, if you had a class full of kids who weren't native Australians, they might not actually know, wouldn't know what the typical Australian things were. They would genuinely have to look things up, find out what Australians do. Um, then the student reads another translated line from the transcript. Anzac Day is an emotional day. If you just said that, you'd have to explain what Anzac Day is. You'd have to explain that to lots of kids. Imagine if you had international students, you'd have to explain everything. Then another student says, I'm sorry, but Anzac Day is touchy. It's also so uniquely Australian. I don't know any other country that celebrates a war like Australia does. It's very strange to me coming from my background. It's a very strange concept, very strange concept. Um, another student says, same for Italians. Student one, oh, that's a good perception. Then student one reads out again, what is the most important festival in Australia? Again, it's too typical. We have a broad spectrum of nationalities here. If your background is not Australian, you'll have other days that are important too. Student two says, you can't, re you can't really say we eat lamb. If you have Muslim kids in the class, it's culturally insensitive. Student one says, it's very stereotypical, exactly. Um, the teacher should be saying, Australia Day means different things to different people because we are such a multicultural, it's also, in fact, the day Australia was discovered, not just that we eat lamb, but it's a good way to bring those things up to find out whose family celebrates what, their religions. Like I wouldn't even know the different countries. It would be interesting to find out from the kids. Then student two says, but then you'd have to talk about Aboriginal history and what Australia Day might mean to them. It's definitely not as nice and happy for them as for others. It's more a way to show a broad range of what's different. It's a good way to include, you should show as many different things as possible. I mean, Australian, what is that? Yes, what is that? So we can see from this kind of around the houses discussion that, that the, the pre-service teachers were happening, um, were having there, um, a number of different things are, are going on there. Um, they start out themselves with some quite stereotypical notions of, Italians and Australians and you know perhaps a troubling kind of uh, tendency to talk about what native Australians and and um, what people might or might not know but we can see that just through the discussion they start to unpack and develop some uh, some more nuance in thinking about what the teacher could be doing and should be doing um, and finally end up you know, kind of questioning, well, what does it actually mean to be Australian? Um, so, you know, we can kind of see a really interesting trajectory in that discussion, um, prompted by them looking at what other teachers were doing and, and feeling comfortable to kind of critique what the teachers might be saying. So this piece of research kind of was, was one of the, the key pieces of research that brought forward my strand of int interest in um, intercultural understanding. Um, and I'm going to briefly kind of run through in the in our book what uh, different themes we have um, and then just talk a little bit more about how the theor theoretical ideas have evolved for me, um, but not necessarily for everyone in the book. So the book has um, the, a first section which really focuses on school curriculum. Um, and so I, I have a chapter there based on New South Wales, but actually based on the next iteration of, of curriculum. So not the one I talked about um, in that earlier slide, um, but the implementation of national curriculum in New South Wales, one of the larger states in Australia. Um, and then chapter three comes from the Norwegian context and talks about um, a new curriculum that was introduced, which involves intercultural competence and multilingualism um, in Norway and was implemented in 2020. Then we have Anushka's chapter, so she'll be talking about that shortly. The second section of the book, um, you'll recognise your McGill colleagues, those of you from McGill, um, in chapter five, looking at plurilingual identity and pluricultural competence with adult English language learners. <clears throat> chapter six comes from Colombia and looks at the intersection and the power relations um, in the curriculum when we have indigenous languages and immigrant languages coexisting, but perhaps not in balanced ways. Chapter seven, Gary will talk um, to you about shortly. Um, and that's about some work that we've been doing with pre-service teachers and their identities. And the final section of the book kind of broadens out 
to a, a few other learning environments in which these key ideas of multilingualism, identity and interculturality feature. Um, chapter eight from Austria in a private language company where um, they explore, um, Elizabeth Barakos there explores what intercultural competence it looks like and how it's positioned in this sort of business model. Um, and then chapter nine, Janelle Upton um, looks at the refugee experience in Australia and how students construct their identities in Australian schools. And I wrap up the book with sort of the reflections on the theoretical um, and practical implications of some of these ideas. So in the book, I really didn't want to prescribe to the other authors exactly how to deal with these notions, because I think the very point that kind of emerges from our consideration of interculturality and identity um, is that, you know, we have to very much look at the individual context, um, different settings um, and what that means to the individuals involved. However, there were kind of some kind of broad intersections that I hoped would be highlighted um, through the, the development of the book. Um, it, you can see with the different colours there intersecting. So between multilingualism and identity, the, the idea that, that both are dynamic, that they're evolving, um, that they rely on interaction um, and develop and change through those interactions between interculturality and identity, that we have both existing at both a group and an individual level and that sometimes there's tension and differences between what the, the group uh, notion of interculturality and the group notion of identity might be and what they mean to the individual. And then between interculturality and multilingualism, this idea of really challenging, challenging the status quo, challenging some of these traditional notions of language and culture as tied to a particular nation um, and, and those very rigid boundaries that we perhaps see in, in the way some of those ideas are treated. And in the centre there that all three notions are complex and are multiple and you know that we very much need to explore and understand context in order to really unpack the ideas in a meaningful way um, in different settings. So starting off um, in terms of my own engagement with the idea of multilingualism, um, my work has been based very much um, within the language education field and how multilingualism has been viewed there. So we've we've seen over the last you know, decade or so um, what's been termed a multilingual turn, um, where perhaps the linguistic repertoires of students, even within a language classroom, hadn't been historically recognised or, or in, count, um, counted for in the planning and in teaching, um, but that very much changing over the last decade or so. Um, alongside that, the, um, the understanding of identity kind of intertwining with multilingualism increasingly in a range of research and sort of practitioner research with people trying to understand um, how identities are being fostered um, and how they're existing within the language classroom. Um, but very much working within a, a context like Australia, where there is an enduring monolingual mindset that the educational policy um, is very much uh, driven by a monolingual um, ideology and a monolingual underpinning. Um, and this may be the same for people working in other contexts where the majority language is also a powerful lingua franca um, and where the power disparity with other languages in the community is glaringly uneven. So we, in, in the Australian context, we are talking about language education, but that's not equal for everyone. Um, different forms of multilingualism are not equally valued. Um, we see community languages, um, those being you know, immigrant languages, not treated equally in the discourse um, to, you know, those sort of a traditional foreign languages even um, as uh, treated in a, in a different way. And indigenous languages also treated in a different way. So we see different sort of pockets of multilingualism, but not all been, being seen. Um, in policy and in the public eye in the same sort of way. Um, and so in kind of working on multilingualism in this context, I've drawn on the work of Alistair Pennycook um, and Emi Otsuji, two researchers in Sydney, who have 
you know, problematized and really kind of thought about the term multilingualism. And they've crit critiqued it quite a lot, but I, st I still stick with the term multilingualism. But I do like some of what they they have had to say um, about monolingualism and how it has become the way that we think about languages. Um, and so they have said monolingualism is a social contra construct which served the colonial era and shaped the way that languages continue to be labelled and viewed as distinct and representative of national boundaries. Um, they say that the idea of monolingualism is an unfortunate historical myth that has become a key structuring principle that organises the entire range of modern social life. Um, and I suppose, you know, I find that a compelling quote to kind of push push me in my own research to try and find ways to to change that, to disrupt the way that, you know, policies exist in our education system and to try and push for multilingualism to be viewed as, you know, normal, as the norm um, and to try and help the valuing of all the different forms of multilingualism that exist in our society. So um, identity has another key construct here um, in my research um, and my work with teachers um, has drawn from Bonnie Norton's work throughout my career. Um, my PhD looked at, P at um, children's identities and how they evolved in a bilingual program, but also when they had multiple languages in their home lives. And I really connected with Bonnie's work where she has, you know, positioned identity as dynamic and constantly changing, um, identity as complex, contradictory and multifaceted, something that constructs and is constructed by language. So when with, with the real focus on multilingualism and language, um, this notion of identity fits well with that. Um, but also very much that she has accounted for um, in her writing, the influence of the larger social processes of power, which you know are essential to kind of think about, you know, why different forms of multilingualism are being treated in different ways, whilst why certain identities are allowed in the classroom and not allowed in the classroom. Um, we know we can't really ignore those larger processes of power if we want to really delve into the issues in a meaningful way. Um, but also that, that 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 her notions of identity, in particular, I've drawn on on the term investment, also very much linked to what happens in the classroom. Um, so I always like my research to end up quite applied and um, to be theories that I can kind of see happening in practice. Um, there are, however, some, you know, kind of some challenges still with this post-structural approach to identity. It doesn't really help us to, to see and understand how individual agency fit into the mix, um, but it does um, allow us to account for these power relationships within interaction and to understand how negotiation takes place in different interactions and our identity is, you know, developed, resisted um, in those interactions. Um, but the more that I engage with them, um, you know, different contexts and, and in pulling this book together, reading about other people's perceptions around identity. So I've seen that um, the ideas of agency is kind of troubling <laughs> in some contexts and doesn't really doesn't really fit. Um, and that freedom of identity, that freedom to choose who you want to be in any given situation is not the case for everyone. This is, in fact, an elite privilege to be able to be in a you know in a position where your identity is kind of accepted if you want to show it you can um, and not every context is like that um, you know there are some cases and in um, Norton's work with Clement more recently in 2021 they unpack you know this idea that you know it we some people you know in some circumstances don't have the freedom of choice of of being certain aspects of their identity you know for their own safety they they have to kind of go with the group identity. <clears throat> and interculturality here is our third strand. Um, very much in my own work comes from a language education perspective. And um, very aware that, you know, intercultural, the intercultural understanding, intercultural competence, you know, they're all big terms, big fields treated differently in different um, contexts. Um, the international education context being one. Um, but one which, you know, it is, isn't where I kind of see my work fitting the best. Um, so in the Australian context, um, 
we've we've developed um, a term of it called intercultural stance, very much embedded in the teaching of language um, and a stance you might take towards engaging with languages in a language classroom. And this is very much um, embedded in the ability to empathise, to recognise your own biases, assumptions, to um, recognise what shapes your opinions, to avoid kind of trying to do that labelling that is human nature, but um, problematic when, when it leads to stereotypes, um, <clears throat> and to try to value a variety of opinions. And Angela Scarino and Tony Lidico have been quite big um, players in the Australian context in kind of shaping how curriculum has ended up in encompassing this idea of intercultural understanding or intercultural stance. <clears throat> I guess one of the key things to consider is both um, how interculturality can be a group or a community endeavour or an individual thing. Um, and in my sort of writing and thinking in more recent years and the intersection with identity, I suppose the individual, the individual has really kind of come to the fore for me as something that we really need to think a bit more about. Um, that um, in the Australian context, perhaps what we're wanting to do with the idea of interculturality is to foster in school students this openness to different views, um, to understanding other people without judgment. Um, and from my perspective, that starts with an individual person kind of reflecting on themselves, looking internally, thinking about who they are and questioning that um, before you can then develop an openness to others. There needs to be a level of self-awareness first. Um, and in the intercultural stance work, that identity aspect is there, but it hasn't been very heavily kind of emphasised in terms of what teachers in classrooms might be able to do to help their students really internalise that process and to, to make some form of lasting change. So for me, the overlap with identity there is that we need some form of identity change for this development of intercultural understanding to be a lasting one, to be something that we then do in lots of different scenarios, um, rather than feeling like we understand a certain group of people, um, but haven't necessarily changed the way we interact with the world. <clears throat> so intercultural understanding typically and traditionally in, in some of the literature has required a clearly separate us and them to serve as points of comparison. Um, and that is great as a starting point, but becomes problematic if the reflection on interculturality doesn't move beyond the um, stereotypical sort of assumptions of group membership. <clears throat> um, as an, and, and it relates back to some of the identity literature here, where um, Norton has said that to view individuals merely as representative of a particular aspect of group identity is to disregard many other aspects of who people are, um, and to overlook um, the power relations um, inherent in the construction of social identity. Um, so I really see some, you know, some close alignment here between thinking about identity and thinking about being intercultural and that without this sort of awareness of our own identities and the potential to, you know, to change and reflect on that, um, it's very difficult to then have sort of meaningful, deep intercultural understanding about other people. So what I argue for in, in a number of the pieces I've written recently is this need to consider some more so to consider in more depth the complexity of identity and how that influences intercultural understanding. <clears throat> so overall, excuse me, <clears throat> overall, um, you know, in the in in my chapters within the book and in what I'd sort of tasked the other chapter writers to consider, um, I really wanted to see how these ideas intersect some more and in different con different ways in different contexts and to highlight different ways of approaching these three key notions, because we do see in the academic literature, you know, a few key writers always being cited. And, um, and as we encounter different contexts, we see there are other ways of viewing this. Um, but I'd like to sort of end with um, um, this notion that, you know, multiplicity and variety is key. Um, Henry talks about multilingual identity being much more than just adding together discrete different linguistic identities. I would similarly argue that 
becoming more intercultural or de developing interculturality is much more than understanding separate, discrete, cult labelled cultures um, that for meaningful and lasting interculturality, a change of our own identity is, is necessary and an openness to questioning and critiquing the way that we see the world. I'd like to hand over to Gary now to share about his chapter. Hi. I'll stop sharing and see whether you can. Uh, can you see that now? Yes. Great. OK, thanks so much, Ruth. And uh, hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Gary Bonner. And on behalf of my colleagues, Dr. Mei Hui Wang and Dr. Ruth Fielding, I'd like to briefly present our research into pre-service language teacher multilingual identities. So we all teach future language teachers here at the Faculty of Education. And uh, so these teachers would be teaching languages you may know as world languages or modern foreign languages. So with Asian languages, for example, Japanese, Chinese, Indonesian, Korean, and European languages, you know, Italian, French, German, and so on. As Ruth mentioned before, our backgrounds are as language teachers. So Mei Wei is a teacher of Mandarin Chinese and English as an additional language. Uh, Ruth is French and German, and myself is Italian, Japanese, and EAL. So I'll begin with a, um, just give you some context of this particular study. As I said, we're, we're located in Melbourne, which is the capital city uh, of Australia's second most populated state of Victoria. And compulsory education in, this in Australia is a state responsibility. And Victoria is probably seen as the state with maybe the strongest languages program. So about two thirds of students in Australia attend government schools. And the data you see here was collected from government schools in 2020 in Victoria. So we have about 17 languages taught in mainstream schools in primary and secondary schools. And the chart shows you the, uh, the total numbers for the most commonly studied languages in those schools, in secondary schools. But in addition to that, we have other languages taught, for example, in out of school programs or distance language education programs or community language programs. So all up, we'd have about 74 or 75 languages taught uh, in Victoria, and that was data from 2020. However, as in probably many parts of the world, our schools often struggle to attract and retrain teachers, particularly with language teachers. And this is especially the case in more regional and rural areas. Also, the status of language learning in schools is often problematic in Australia, as we sort of touched on before. Um, we have a, although we have a very diverse and multilingual population, there's a common perception that language learning is less important than some other subjects in the school curriculum. And that does create additional challenges for languages teachers. So turning to this research now, we had uh, two sort of uh, main aims. First was to a, gain a greater understanding of the nature and formation of pre-service language teacher identity. And then secondly, we wanted to better understand and support these pre-service teachers during their initial teacher education, where they're working with us, during their placements or practicum in schools, and then following up when they're out to schools and teaching. So the data that I'm going to talk about, which was in the chapter there, this, this comes from a larger longitudinal study, mixed method study that we're doing. And we've been working with participants from, as I said, that early stage of their initial teacher education all the way through until they graduate and are teaching. So the three people that I'll be talking about today from that first iteration of this study back in 2020, and we've been catching up with them ever since then. The, the quantitative aspect or part of the study is what's called a bi-person factor analysis using Q methodology. And data from that uh, part of the study will be, some of that will be published in an upcoming volume uh, on looking particularly at using this approach to language research. So now turning to how we've conceptualized this research, and this builds on very much what Ruth has already int uh, introduced before. So I'll briefly outline a theoretical framework guiding the research. So the research seeks to combine the elements of the intercultural stance, which Ruth just talked about, which Lidicote and Scarino have written extensively on, and also that multilingual identity negotiation framework that Ruth uh, has developed from her study originally with the multilingualism in Australian schools. 
So bringing those together, we have this um, multilingual identity approach to intercultural stance. So what I'll do here is I'll just briefly outline each of those five components, starting from the, the top one down. So interrelationship of language and culture. So when learning a new language, students consider how language and culture are interrelated. So intercultural stance positions language and culture as indivisible, so they cannot be taught separately. Likewise, in thinking about multilingual identity, cultural connections and connections to languages are viewed as interrelated. So, but it must be noted at times, this may involve tensions and conflicts in, in how these terms interrelate. Moving down to imagined connections or imagined identities, when students begin learning a new language, they form imagined and real connections to the new language. If taking an intercultural approach, they will also make links to languages already in their repertoire. So Norton's concept of imagined identities suggests how self-perception is key in the formation of connections to language communities. Developing a perception of connection is more important than physical connection. So such a perceived connection can lead learners to view themselves as members of that community and therefore show investment in that language. This is even more important when the language may, being studied may be geographically distant from the learner. So language learning classrooms should be spaces where multilingual identities are validated and where multiple languages coexist in different ways for each learner. Self-concept and self-awareness play a larger role in the development of multilingual identity as learners begin to view themselves as speakers of a new language. So when, within multilingual identity work, Norton and McKinney say, every time learners speak, they're negotiating and renegotiating a sense of self in relation to the larger social world. So closely linked to that notion of imagined connections to languages, language learners must develop uh, feelings of belonging to the target language communities in order to develop an associated multilingual identity. Without a feeling of belonging, multilingual identity may remain elusive. So feelings of belonging are related to community acceptance, but seen as somewhat separate, in that a learner may feel an affiliation with the language community, yet not obtain admittance to a language community. The perception of the group around them may differ from their self-affiliation. And then finally, we have consideration of self and others, which is also referred to as reflexivity in language learning sphere. So becoming an emerging multilingual means learning to consider and question the ways in which we see the world in an individual way, and the ways in which we might or might not share group characteristics assigned to us by others. In critically appraising their own characteristics and uniqueness, learners can then more deeply see how others may be both individuals and members of certain groups, sharing some characteristics, but perhaps not all. This awareness of the complexity of others requires a deep level of reflection on the self in order to engage in something beyond a labeling of others with particular characteristics, traits, or beliefs. So now I'll turn to our pre-service teachers and their thoughts as expressed during the interviews that followed the cue sorting process. So in these extracts taken from the book chapter, what I'll be attempting to show is how the elements from the theoretical framework can not only help to gain a deeper understanding of what's being said, but also how this understanding can be put to work in various ways. So I'll begin with Natalie. Uh, Natalie is born in South America and her first language was Spanish. Her family migrated to Australia when she was young, so most of her schooling was done in English. As a speaker of a variety of Spanish, Natalie expressed some conflicts between her cultural connection to the variety of Spanish that she grew up with and the standardized language that is typically found in language textbooks used to teach Spanish in schools. So she explained this attitude as follows. For Spanish, at least, it's just which one culture. It's not something like German, which is very much Germany. And in my French schooling, we only ever learned French culture. We never touched on Canadian culture or anything. And it was really an opportunity that was missed because I know a lot of Spanish programs go directly to Spain, when in reality, the language that is spoken in Spain is the least common because most of the language transitioned 
And there is a kind of standard in South America, whereas in Spain, it's quite different. So although she did acknowledge that there are challenges in trying to make a curriculum which is inclusive of all these varieties of Spanish, Natalie, for this, this went to a fundamental recognition of her identity as a speaker of a variety of Spanish. So in fact, in, in preparing for her teaching placement, she went into the curriculum and she made a point of consulting that so she could then reassure herself and her future students or the students she would be teaching then that it was acceptable for them to use the varieties of a language that they were familiar with. However, there was one caveat in the document that they had to make sure they were consistent in this usage. So at one level, we can say that this suggests a more inclusive approach in the curriculum documents and from the curriculum authorities. But we can also critique that for reinforcing an unreal, unrealistic notion of language purity, which is particularly relevant to, for someone like Natalie, who is actively immersed in varieties of Spanish in her daily life through her use of social media and online mainstream media. So Natalie's own experience as a student and now as a beginning teacher suggests that reflecting on this aspect of her multilingual identity can serve as a tangible resource that she can draw on to support her future students, who may also be navigating these diverse interactions of languages and cultures. So this applies not just to learners of Spanish, but also other languages where you have a multiple range of varieties, such as Chinese, Italian, and French. So Ken and feelings of belonging. So Ken is an L1 user of Vietnamese, and he learned English in upper primary school when he was in Vietnam, and he moved into an international school. It was not until he commenced his university studies in Australia that he began studying Japanese as part of his degree. And this interest in Japanese was partially, partially sparked by his experiences during a six month exchange uh, program to Japan when he was in high school in Vietnam. So during our interviews, we were interested in understanding how these pre-service teachers navigate the use of their multiple languages in their professional and personal spaces. For teachers of an L2, it can be challenging to initiate and or maintain ongoing connections to language communities and sustain regular use of their additional languages. This can also be influenced by how they perceive, how they perceive themselves to be accepted members of physical or virtual language communities. So for language teachers such as Ken, who experienced some anxiety over their self-assessed proficiency, language proficiency, the acceptance and sense of belonging can provide important validation. So in addition, in addition to his ongoing uh, Japanese language lessons that Ken does with a tutor, he also spoke of the value he gained from his online networks with friends in Japan that he made during his uh, stay there. And Ken described the typical way these interactions unfolded as follows. We definitely start by saying greetings in Japanese and something like that. It depends on the conversation, what's the topic. Sometimes if it's casual, which is most of the time, it's casual. We definitely talk mostly in English. But then if that week I'm studying something about Japanese or something like that, I'll try it and I'll ask them, is that correct? I'm being aware of what I've learned and I try to use it in these social networks, these social contexts, sorry. I think that's the best way to learn because you're not being judged by anyone. Your friends can fix you at any time. So in this example, it's evident that Ken has opportunities to not only maintain and develop his language proficiency in Japanese, but also to actively engage in communities of diverse linguistic repertoires. So as future teachers of language students who may also struggle to build a sense of belonging to a new language community, Ken can reflect on and share these own experiences with his students of these interactions with individuals who are supportive of each other's emerging multilingual identities. So our third participant is Craig. Craig is an L1 user of English and he began learning Indonesian by chance as his first preferences of French and Japanese were full when he enrolled in his new high school. He had no background in Indonesian or no connection to the country, but he found the language learning both easy and enjoyable. A school trip to Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, for a week at the age of 16 was the catalyst 
for his desire to continue with the subject in his secondary school years. Craig puts this interest down to his success he was achieving in the language and to the influence his teachers had on him as role models. So reflecting on his Indonesian language teachers from school, who had actually all learned Indonesian as an additional language, Craig commented that as a student, you're looking at the teacher and you look at them as all knowing in the language and that they're perfectly fluent. Whether that was true or not at the time, that was the goal you wanted to achieve. And then when you went over, when you had the year, when I had the year 10 trip, she, his teacher, was able to organize everything and she was able to go in deeper conversations with the people over there. That was something I strive for. So for many language learners, the problematic concept of native speaker as a standard against which one must be measured is not only unrealistic, but often de detrimental to the language learner's sense of being connected with the language. So if the language is forever positioned as belonging to only those born in a certain part of the world, and native like fluency, the benchmark for measuring progress, then there will always be an insurmountable barrier to being to being able to be imagined to imagine some ownership of the language. So in Craig's case, the fact that his Indonesian uh, classes at school and then in university, he had mostly teachers of Indonesian who had learned it as a second or additional language, seems to have had a positive impact and influence on his imagined connection with the language and his imagined identity as an L1 user, L2 user of Indonesian. So in that brief uh, phrase there where he says, and this is the follow-up quote where we asked him about what he was going to try and do in his placement, he mentioned that in his introduction, he wants to relate to them by saying, I was a former student at this school. I studied Indonesian just like you at this school. So what we can see there, it's a way that for him not only to share with his students his multilingual identity and connection with the language, but also an open invitation for them to create their own imagined identities of their, of their um, imagined identities and connections with the language. So I'm not suggesting here that L1 teachers are not able to make these connections here, but as Ruth mentioned previously, in a country such as Australia, where there's a pervasive monolingual mindset and multilingualism as appears to be the exception rather than the norm, there's an ongoing urgent need to unlearn monolingualism as Angela Scarino has uh, aptly stated. So the implications from this study so far, well, what we hope that people will take away is first of all, in conceptualizing this pedagogical model for the development of student multilingual identity, we've drawn on the work of Fisher and they've suggested that an overt and fundamentally participatory approach is required so that students are engaged in the active and conscious process of considering their linguistic and multilingual identities and to become aware of the possibilities of change in relation to these identities. So while we strongly agree with that, 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 that concept there, what we do think is that there's going to be a lot of value in maybe, um, first of all, beginning with teachers, pre-service teachers and in-service teachers and using the framework that we've suggested in this chapter to do that very important work of unpacking some of these complexities. So we argue that the experiences and con connections the language teachers have with their languages and the related cultures are rich and complex. So any work done with, with teachers, whether they're pre-service teachers or in-service in teachers needs to be mindful of that. And also to be careful that we don't um, go back into this idea of just reporting on experience or discourses of interculturality. What we do is try and encourage pre-service teachers to consider their own identities in depth as part of their intercultural repertoire. So just looking ahead from this study, I mentioned this is a, a larger multi um, a mixed methods uh, study. So what we're hoping to do is that make this research relevant both to current and pre-service uh, teachers, maybe as examples or vignettes of how previous pre-service teachers are imagining and expressing their identities. Also, we're looking for schools and, and future and current mentors of these pre-service teachers so they're able to engage with, in this discourse with the people they're supporting. For, our, for us as, as well as language teacher educators in initial teacher education to support and prepare these pre-service teachers to engage in this important work 
and then also reaching out to our professional associations, whether it's to just empirical data, but also how they can support pre-service language teachers, both in terms of professional learning or in their advocacy work. So I'll just finish up there. And unfortunately, I have to leave early because I have a class to teach soon, but I'd just like to uh, uh, offer an invitation. I'm really looking forward to getting any feedback, comments. You can connect with me there on email or through Twitter. And I'd just like to thank the wonderful people at the Plurilingual Lab for making this event and all the other events possible. And also to thank Ruth for her fantastic work in bringing this work together. It's a real honor to be included alongside the other authors in this volume here. So thanks for everyone who's joined today and I look forward to hearing from you sometime soon. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me, Angelica and your team, and also uh, Ruth for inviting me to be part of the, the volume. I'm very happy to be here. My name is Anushka van het Hoofd, and I'm working in Mexico. I'm going to take you to Mexico for the next 15 minutes. Uh, I'm working at a public university, and um, I work from the social anthropology area perspectives on language use in society. And um, I first want to like sketch the local context. We have over 7 million speakers of indigenous languages in uh, Mexico, but over uh, 25 million people identify, self-identify as being indigenous or being part of an indigenous community. And um, well, of course, you know that all these uh, languages are in different situations, language vitality situations. We have, um, well, some say uh, 68 languages, others say we have 364 language varieties belonging to 11 different language uh, families. All these languages are minority languages or minoritized languages. And here is, I think, where multilingualism comes in because I understand multilingualism not as something neutral, but embedded in social processes of what counts as a legitimate speaker or a language or practices. And that means that I understand it like this broader, broader social political context in which indigenous languages are positions. And this context is a context, um, unfortunately, of discrimination, marginalization, exclusion. We don't have infrastructure or resources to protect uh, indigenous linguistic rights. And all this diversity, uh, number of speakers and varieties of the languages that exist in Mexico is like a serious challenge for uh, a lot of different areas. And one of these areas, of course, is our educational system. Um, this is the area where I'm going to speak to you about. We're going to have uh, an example from the Maya uh, language in the Yucatan Peninsula. So, so first, the, the idea of interculturality, because I think that in the Latin American context, interculturality is like um, seen in a very different light. Um, Interculturality from the government standpoint is seen as a process to integrate indigenous peoples in the dominant language and culture. And we have an educational model that goes with uh, this idea that is called intercultural bilingual education and that operates in primary uh, in primary schools in, in so-called indigenous regions and some bigger cities with indigenous presence. There are also intercultural universities, which I will talk about a little later on in my talk. Um, but this model has been criticized for not generating a real uh, bilingual process in which students learn two languages as something desirable, as something that enriches uh, both the students and society. Uh, also, these children don't um, develop the habit to read and write in their mother tongue um, and there are no materials available like educational materials 
Um, so the general assessment is that uh, learning materials for indigenous children are created through the lens of the dominant culture and fail to be culturally relevant. And all of this, of course, sends a message of lower prestige and less social value of indigenous languages and cultures. So interculturality means then that um, we need a, like a strategy uh, to change this rather functional view of interculturality uh, to one that questions the causes of uh, this asymmetry and social cultural inequalities. Um, so Catherine Walsh makes the case for a critical interculturality and that initiates with a profound questioning of this system. And she says that interculturality becomes a political, social, ethical and epistemic project needed to change structures um, conditions and mechanisms of power that maintain inequalities, inferiorization, racialization, and discrimination. So this is kind of the context. And our project then was to create uh, digital learning materials in uh, different indigenous languages. And therefore, we uh, turned to Bonnie Norton, and uh, she was uh, very helpful of uh, making available to us her platform. Uh, that is the uh, Storybooks Canada project, which in itself is part of an African storybook project and then we created the storybook Mexico projects and that means that we uh, create materials that are multimodal materials based on stories it has text images audio um, we can make dual uh, like uh, books out of it and it already has different levels and they are digital so we can also um, kind of um, help children um, not only to attain indigenous literacy, but also digital literacy. Um, I want to present the case for uh, Yucatan Maya, uh, the people themselves call their language Maya Tan. It has 850,000 speakers and that's quite a lot. Uh, and um, 1.6 million people self-identify as Maya. However, uh, even if it's a majority language in the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, it is a language that uh, is in rapid extinction. And that has to do with the fact that um, socialization is not common anymore in the indigenous uh, communities. Only one in three children are socialized in the Maya language. Um, Maya has a long history of literacy. We all, all know the, the codices, the Maya codices. And um, like speaking and writing in Maya is uh, or has become a purposeful and strategic expression of Mayan identity. And some authors speak even of a new stage of Mayan ethnogenesis that uh, is in particularly promoted at intercultural universities. And intercultural universities are um, this um, more or less new project in which in different rural uh, areas where uh, indigenous peoples live, um, these universities are created. And um, the teachers who work there, they have like a clear view of the needs and wishes of the local Population. They usually conduct collaborative studies in the, in the localities and seek to include indigenous values, perspectives and practices in the educational space. So what we did is we reached out to one of those uh, universities, that's the Intercultural Maya University of Quintana Roo. And uh, these are the um, people we have been working with. Our research question was not only uh, we wanted to make or create materials, um, there were already a lot of stories on the, um, the, the website. So what we wanted to do was translate these stories to create new materials in the Mayan language. Our question or like research question was, how do Maya translators acknowledge identities 
through their translation practice and contribute to critical interculturality when dealing with these new contexts and modes of reading, writing and communication in online spaces. Um, and that means that our three main concepts like multilingualism, interculturally, uh, interculturality, excuse me, and identity are often studied or uh, looking at students or looking at in-service, pre-service teachers. But the people who create learning materials also imprint their identity on the product. So that was kind of our uh, main interest. Uh, and the one we see here uh, with the, um, uh, on, on the left uh, bottom part is Hilario. He was the coordinator of this uh, project. He was the teacher of a translation workshop and we worked together uh, with his uh, students who are in the fifth semester of a, um, a bachelor program. It's called Language and Culture. And Hilario uh, talks about his motivation or interest in our project like this. Um, when he talks about post-colonialism, that means after Mexican independence. And he said that uh, this period for the last uh, 200 years impacted, impacted negatively. And this also applies to translation. It brings us problems. Uh, for example, I'm looking at Panda and how to translate Panda. And I check a dictionary, for example, in, in English, and, and quickly I'll find it. But in Maya, no, this was the first challenge. So there are no equivalents for all um, the vocabulary uh, in the Mayan language. And obviously, with digital resources and all the vocabulary that comes with it, this is uh, a rather a challenge. So I want to give you like a, a few examples of uh, how these translators uh, worked and explained uh, their translation process. We did a few workshops with them and there were, then afterwards there was also an online survey uh, which uh, helped us to gather data about their translation process. Um, so um, the first team, they worked in teams with, for, with two or three uh, people. They said, in this story, the difficulty we encountered was with the word pilot. Um, there already was a definition in the Cordomex dictionary, but the problem we encountered here is, for example, that a Maya speaker, when reading this, if it's only written in Maya, he or she wouldn't figure out what it's meant to say. That means we have a dictionary. Uh, it's a very important one. It was first published in 1980, so that's um, over 40 years ago. It has almost 1400 pages and it's like the reference work for uh, Yucatec Maya. But then there was an equivalent that didn't really help, uh, help the story. So sometimes the translators, translators felt awkward with the result, but accepted their subject position as students and conceded to the teacher's view, or in this case, to uh, an authority like the dictionary. Um, they expressed to be open to change, uh, but most teams adopted a rather purist attitude to writing Maya. Um, they rejected the, you, the idea of using loan translations, for example, or Hispanicized names that are common in everyday spoken language and consider that the written expression of Maya can and should be developed with its own resources. So another example is when they say a lot of people use hasta que. Hasta que is uh, particularly something in Spanish when you say goodbye to someone. Uh, they Hispanicize it. That is, they use a direct loan translation, but we agree that since we're working on an academic text that will be online, we cannot use a loan, but need to recur to interlingual equivalents. So they use a lot of uh, specialized terms that uh, adopted and they adopted kind of a subject position as translators rather than students and that made them gain like a position of strength and they uh, claimed more powerful identities through this use of um, uh, specialized terms in their uh, explanation um, and it also kind of uh, displayed confidence in their choices. Another thing what 
uh, was interesting to us is that they also expressed views uh, and thoughts about the intercultural process. For example, they say we adapted the text to the Mayan language so that they can be comprehended. So yes, probably they are attractive to children. Um, they were positive about the end uh, results. And um, kind of summing it up, I, I think uh, the important thing is that in the translation process, these young translators positions them positioned themselves sometimes as students, sometimes as translators or users of digital technologies. And um, they, the learning materials were associated with novel ways of literacy learning. And um, these novel ways challenge prevailing um, educational models, but they also wanted to firmly root their translation um, perspective in Maya literacy traditions and uh, also attitudes towards the language and the written form of the language. And um, their motivation originated from the knowledge about the situation and position of the language in the multilingual setting and their vision of how digital media might constitute a factor of social change. So rather than the promotion of indigenous literacy in particular, they framed the development of learning materials within a context of claiming visibility for their language in general to others. Because online presence of an indigenous language raises social prestige, uh, prestige sorry, within the community and expresses its worth like uh, to exist amid languages of wider communication. So their target is the Maya language itself as an issue of equity. And their more conservative approach in the language work um, aim to display the resources of the local language as independent from Spanish and suitable for the modern technological world. So at the same time, it was also a sign of respect towards other Mayanists who had created reference works. And it was also possibly fueled by a lack of authority. They felt themselves as commencing translators of Maya. Um, how does this uh, play out in a broader sense? I think uh, I would like to uh, talk about three um, main issues. First, first language reclamation, because Multilingualism raises uh, issues of equity in society. So in the framework of our project, it concerned the promotion of indigenous literacies that enhance human agency and help indigenous learners develop a sense of their own identity. So it involves the need to develop literal dis di excuse me, digital literacies in the indigenous languages based on the students' languages proficiencies and heterogeneous multilingual practices with content that is culturally relevant. So in their call for new practices of teaching, learning and ways of relating, community-based initiatives uh, have to go against the dominant educational model that does not consider these um, differences and um, as a result, the creation of literacy learning materials and the promotion of literacy learning becomes part of a bigger issue. And digital technologies are like a way to address uh, all these issues um, because it offers a means to understand how creators produce and negotiates, negotiates negotiate identities and envision the written expression of their indigenous languages in their multilingual speech community. So I believe for several reasons that digital technologies have a potential to um, be a powerful tool for the development of indigenous literacy. It, it is said it bridges the gap between oral and written discourse. Uh, it enables multi-model ways of learning. It is inclusive to indigenous forms of transmitting linguistic and cultural knowledge, such as, such as storytelling. And uh, all of this is crucial um, for the students to develop a sense of their own identity. 
And of course, digital technologies can also lead to new forms of exclusion. So it's important to uh, prevent the creation of literacy inequalities in these digital spaces. And um, um, Ruth talked a little bit about agency and the freedom of identity uh, like an elite privilege. And uh, I think uh, quite a bit of that is true for our translators because of course they are in a privileged position. They use digital technologies on a daily basis. Um, but in this current context of language loss, I think it's important to examine and discuss how these digital spaces may contribute to uh, language uh, reclamation. And in these discussions, these young indigenous language speakers should be taken into account as vital actors because they contribute to literacy development both from within and outside institutional efforts. And the acknowledgement of their agency as multilingual, multi-competent actors in the creation of these materials will provide more insight into the future of indigenous literacies. So apart from desiring something for themselves, these um, the translators um, helped us uh, and were motivated to change these hegemonic perspectives on the development of indigenous literacies. And they see digital technologies as tools to dignify and make their language visible on the internet. Um, that's what I wanted to share with you uh, today. These are some of the references. Geretats about Maya resurgence. Uh, McCarthy language reclamation. The Iglesias talks about Maya language vitality and socialization and identity. Filer um, has this uh, information about Maya language and literacy education and Walsh, of course, about interculturality in the Latin American context. And I uh, just want to acknowledge all the people who helped us uh, with this project. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Awurum. Thank you to all the uh, panelists today for this wonderful discussion. I now hand it over to uh, my colleague, Hannah, Hannah Kim, to moderate the discussion.